What the fuck? A while back, I got this first generation iPod Shuffle from a bulk lot of untested electronics, and after connecting it to my computer, it just wouldn't mount the volume or even charge at all. That's when I realised that there was a bulge in the plastic housing, and sure enough, the battery is bloated, so this iPod's no good. Now, I could replace the battery, but those cost more than I paid for this iPod, and I don't really plan on using this for music anyway, so what should I do with this dead iPod then? That's when I remembered this Twitter post from Famicom about putting an SSD inside the enclosure. Now, if you're into retro tech, then I highly recommend you check out her channel. She makes documentary style videos about retro or obscure technology. She's covered topics ranging from optical media format walls to Smaznug. Yes, that Smaznug. So feel free to go check out her videos. I'll wait. You're done? All right then, let's get back to work on this iPod. For this mod, you'll need a 2230 sized M.2 SSD and a USB adapter board. It's extremely important that you get a 2230-sized SSD and not a different type, because M.2 SSDs come in different lengths, and the larger ones won't fit inside the iPod's casing. The same goes for the adapter board. Make sure it's for the 2230-sized SSD. Luckily, I had upgraded the SSD inside my Steam Deck, so the original 1TB SSD is now available to use. As for the adapter board, I just searched on eBay for 2230 SSD USB free adapter, and I found this board here. Now, full disclosure, this is not a flash mod at all, because you will no longer be able to use this as an iPod afterwards. It's going to be a USB SSD only. As funny as it would be to have a 1TB functional iPod Shuffle, I don't have that much music, and why would I use an iPod Shuffle when I have the old reliable here anyway? As for tools, we'll need a prying pick, an opening blade, and a set of needle files. Because we're filing down a PCB, you should also wear iron breathing protection so you don't inhale any of the dust. Before you begin, make sure to fully drain the iPod's battery. You can check the battery level by pressing this button here. And if the battery is fully drained, then the light shouldn't light up. This is because a fully drained battery is less likely to catch fire if you accidentally puncture it. The first thing we'll remove is the power switch. This is just clipped in with plastic, so make sure it's in the off position. And then we could wedge a fingernail underneath it, and then use a prying pick to pop it off. Now comes the most difficult part, which is removing the insides. There are no visible seams on this iPod, so our point of entry will be from the USB plug. Here's one I opened earlier. The insides slide in from the opening, and they're held in place by the USB plug's plastic surround, which is then glued tightly in place. In order to get in, you'll need to cut through the glue using a prying blade. Some guides mention using a sharp knife, and while that's a viable option, it's a little risky because you can slip and accidentally cut yourself, even if you're wearing gloves. And also, the battery's right behind the connector, so if you push the blade in too far, there's a risk of puncturing the battery. I usually start by scoring one of the long edges with a prying blade, and occasionally twisting it side to side like this. Eventually, it'll make a dent in the glue layer that will allow the blade to be held in place and inserted further. Once the blade is in, I can gently rotate it again side to side to loosen the glue around the edges. You might hear some cracking, and that's just the sound of the glue. Like that. Now, it's important that you do not leave the blade up and down in this direction, as this will put strain on the plastic housing of the iPod, and you risk causing cracks or permanent deformations. In order to further loosen the glue, I can also apply a small amount of isopropyl alcohol into the gap. Normally with glues like this, I use an iFixit eye opener tool, which can be used to melt the glue, but since the battery is so close, it is not safe to apply heat in this area. Once one side is freed, we can then move on to the other long edge. And again, we do the exact same steps as before, and eventually it'll be free too. This takes a very long time, so be patient and work carefully. Don't rush, and don't use excessive force. When both sides are free, we can gently rock the USB plug up and down, which will twist and weaken the glue on the other two short sides. Again, we can apply some alcohol to weaken the glue on either side. Eventually, the USB plug will be free. Using the pick, we can push on a headphone jack and gently slide the internals out. Now, since the battery is bloated, this can be quite difficult, so take your time and don't rush.
We can't just slide the SSD and the adapter board directly into the iPod's housing because the board is a little too wide, so we'll need to make some adjustments. This next part isn't too difficult, but it takes a lot of time. We'll be using needle files to slightly widen the left and right sides of the inside of the iPod, as well as removing a small amount of material on the sides of the board itself. So I just take the file and run it against the inside of the iPod housing like this. And again, also on the other side. When you work on the adapter board, make sure to remove the SSD first beforehand. And take care when doing this. Make a note of where the components are on the board as well as the traces so that you don't cut too far and damage them. Additionally, I also use the triangular file to cut ridges into the sides of the iPod so that the board can slide in and be held in place. Make sure to test the fit every so often. The adapter board won't fill up all the space, so I also cut a piece of pencil eraser to use as a spacer at the very end. During the filing process, the battery check button might fall out, so when you're done filing, you can tape it back in place. Similarly, the power switch can also be popped back in. As for the USB bezel, I cut a piece of card to fit over the gap, but this isn't ideal, and a 3D printed piece will work much better. Now for the final test. When I plug this USB SSD in, it correctly shows up on the computer, and I can format and start using it. Using Blackmagic disk speed check, I'm getting about 400 megabytes per second read and write speed. While it's not quite the 5 gigabit per second speed of USB 3, it's also a lot faster than the 480 megabit per second speeds of the iPod Shuffle. So there you have it. We've taken a dead iPod Shuffle and transformed it into a USB 3 SSD with one terabyte of capacity. We've really done enough to call it a day. However, I do have one more thing. As of the time of recording, the year is 2024. And sure, USB A is good and all, but there are better interfaces out there. And this whole time, I've been hiding something from you all. That's right, this adapter not only has USB-A, but also USB Type-C. It's just a matter of simply flipping the board around. And now I can use this USB SSD with modern computers. Heck, even the iPhone can recognize it and use it as an external recording media for ProRes video capture. As for the cap, unfortunately, it doesn't fit with USB-C. However, I do plan on adding magnets to both the cap as well as the iPod's enclosure so that it will snap into place. Overall, I'm happy with how this project turned out. The iPod Shuffle's casing is more compact than most M.2 enclosures, and I can use this SSD on anything from laptops to phones to my Steam Deck as external storage. I hope you've enjoyed this modding project, and I'll see you in the next one.